Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anusha Zaman, and I'm an art history junior from VCU Arts Qatar, and I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Hassan Hajaj. A photographer, designer, and filmmaker, known as the Andy Warhol of Marrakesh, Hassan Hajaj has bridged various street and mainstream cultures using the streets of Marrakesh as his foundation. He said with quote, my work started because I wanted to show another side of Moroccan culture, something more than that and that the imagery that they understand in the same way. Born in 1961, Hassan Hajaj moved to London in the 1980s where he taught himself photography and design. His work has been described as a fusion of hip hop culture, reggae scenes, and also his North African heritage, which serves to establish a global understanding of Moroccan culture. His recent exhibition, La Caravane, focused on confronting culture-specific values and traditions by mixing traditional and contemporary, contemporary North African culture with popular Western iconography. His works have been exhibited widely, including at the Brooklyn Museum, Nasher Museum of Art, the, the, New, the New York Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Ferjan Collection, and here at the VMFA. Today, he will be joined in conversation with, by curator and critic Dr. Alice Planell. Planell studied art history at Reading University and at London School of Advanced Study. Her doctoral work explored on contemporary artists of Algerian origin. She, had, she has published widely in monographs, catalogues, and journals, and has held the position of deputy director of the Fine Arts Journal of the Middle East. She currently lectures at the King, Kingston University and at the Bristol School of Art. Please join me in welcoming Hassan Hajaj and Dr. Alice Pinnell, who will have a discussion on his paper, Hab Wahad on Finding Inspiration in a Community of Nomads. We're going to start with uh, a piece entitled um, Le Salon, because um, in preparation for this conversation today, um, over the course of nearly a year, we sat together and had a number of conversations um, about Hassan's work, and especially in the context of, the, of um, contemporary Islamic art. And for this conversation, we always sat on low-lying furniture, which is part of this installation, Le Salon. And it seems like a really good uh, prescient place to start, because it talks of the diversity of your work, both in terms of media, but also in terms of cultural diversity. And uh, you said a beautiful sentence to me, Luckily, I recorded all these conversations, um, which went as such. I'm an artist of Moroccan origin and a Muslim, living in London. That is my culture. And to begin, I was wondering if you could tell, tell us a little bit about Le Salon, about the history of the installation, and especially in reference to your culture. Um, Le Salon, basically, I think it was born me growing up in London. Uh, my background, I was unemployed for about six years. And within these six years, me and friends uh, that I grew up with in London from different parts of, of the world, we kind of started doing our own parties because most of the places in London in the 80s and 70s really didn't cater for people like ourselves. So I was the one, the personal one, that would find the space and had to really kind of make it feel good, like decorating or come up with some ideas and trying to have the party say it's welcoming. I realized along the way that in Europe, as you can see, all the chairs are upright. Um, and so when I looked into my culture, trying to kind of come up with something, as you can see, I'm using lots of recycling objects and textiles. I realized after we eat, we always recline, you know, we don't move from the, the chairs. And it's also about sharing. So this really the salon was born from this, and also I was trying to show lots of street um, graphics and usage of, as you can see, the the wallpapers like the sign of the camels that we have in, in, in all over the Arab countries, using the Coca-Cola crates as it's something that's imported from the West to to the Arab countries, and everybody actually sits that use them for seats. So it's kind of trying to play on this usage as space, and also. In, in Moroccan culture, and I'll probably talk about the whole Arab culture, normally we're kind of very welcoming when people come, you want to feed them, you want to, you know, make them stay overnight. And this is really the kind of idea of the Le Salon. Thanks, Hassan. Um, so you say, you talk about being welcoming, and that um, makes me think of um, something else that you said in one of these conversations about the fact that 
Um, Islam is about a rhythm of life, which I thought was quite a beautiful um, sentence, and um, about generosity and about being welcoming. And that led us to a very long conversation. Um, and we then started to talk about um, Islam as culture and then about the diversity of Islamic culture and which you feel, which had quite a lot to say about. So about um, Le Salon, I was wondering if you could tell us more about this. Um, well, I think Le Salon was a couple of different things. You know, I grew up in London, as I say, being influenced by graffiti artists, graphic designers, uh, from all over the place, from the States, from the Caribbean and stuff like this. In the 70s, when I used to say, I'm from Morocco, the first thing they say, oh, sand, camels, dates, tajin, hashish, kaftan. Um, so, you know, in the end, I didn't even want to say where I was coming from, because um, I always, you know, thought this, I knew there was more to this. Um, when I started, I suppose, becoming as an artist, I wanted, you know, my first body of work, you know, I didn't consider myself an artist, I wanted to share it with my friends, I wanted to show something from my culture. So really, I kind of tried to show lots of graphics. As you can see, I'm using lots of graphics, fonts, recycled uh, objects, and also some kind of object that I knew they would communicate to my friends, like the Coca-Cola, even if it's in Arabic, they wouldn't know where it is. And with that, I could bring them also, also into something that's very local. So really, that was the first kind of idea that I had. I was like to do these, you know, I went around collecting all these Arabic products, shot them and printed them on canvases. And I created this salon for people to come look at the artwork and sit down and listen to music. So that was really the kind of idea to show something that I thought we had called, you know, something that's called from the, what's called the Arab countries of Morocco. Um, so that was the beginning of, of, of this thought as well. It was about showing my friends that also inspired me and influenced me along the way in, in what I'm doing. So we're going to come to your friends, very important to your work, um, and we're going to continue on the subject of music. So um, Hassan's work was uh, chosen as part of a very interesting exhibition at the, um, le, um, in Paris, and Musée du Monde Arabe, and it was entitled Treasures of Islam from Africa. And the, the work that was chosen um, is um, this piece, here called uh, Babohot, which is um, a portrait of a Gnawa musician. And I'd love you to talk to us about Gnawa and about uh, your interest in um, Gnawa musicians, but also um, in relation to your interest in Kapoya. Hassan practices Kapoya and cites um, Kobra Mansa as um, an inspiration. Um, for members of our audience, uh, capoeira is a martial dance that's practiced in a circle, or ronda, yeah. and um, to the sound of a very interesting music, uh, musical instrument called um, the berimbau. So, could you tell us more about capoeira and gnawa together? Um, yeah, I mean, this is interesting because we're talking about Islamic, Islamic art here. Um, growing up in Morocco, gnawa is um, a ritual music, it's a spiritual music, it's about if somebody feels sick or you move to a house, you feel there's some spirits, you get them to exorc um, exorcist, the, you know, trying to clean the, the bad energy. Uh, they normally do a ritual called the lila, which is, starts around 10 o'clock and it goes till dawn. They play around with astrology and colours, and each colour has a rhythm and a saint. Um, so this is really Kapo uh, Gnawa, and the, uh, on top of this, lots of Moroccan people, they look down at this, um, this thing because they don't see it as being Islamic, uh, because they recite lots of Quran and you know, lots of this uh, um, uh, religious um, stuff going on with them. Um, also, they're the ancestors of the slaves of Morocco, so they brought their African rituals with them and fused it with Islam. When I started doing Capoeira, maybe in 19, I think it was about 1990, I started to realize there was a kind of a bridge. You know, Capoeira was developed in Brazil. It's African, but there's nothing like it in Africa. And it was developed in Brazil, and it was banned. So lots of the Capoeiristas would have to go in the bush, in the jungle, and play rhythm, pretend, you know, so for example, there's a rhythm. They would be practicing to fight. If they see the masters coming on their horses, they would change the rhythm and pretend they're dancing. Um, I realized there was a kind of a 
a crossroads between them. Um, you know, similar journey from Africa to you know another land, and this some new thing that's got recreated from oppression. Um, so that was my attraction. You know, it was learning as I went along. It wasn't something that I read because most of the Capoeira books and the history got burned by the Portuguese when it got banned. And Gnau, as I said, is something that's been very local kind of folklore. Uh, but since I would say 15 years ago, there's been a Gnau festival that's made a lot of the masters popular and respected from the uh, musicians from around the world. Um, so that's really the bridge of, Gnau, uh, of the Gnau. So I went along, I realized the only images of Gnau, there's been, there's probably about 15, 20 that were taken again by your European photographers back in the 20s and early century. And I realized there's nothing's been documented on them since then. So I took on as a, as a thing that I wanted to do. So I've been documenting them since 1998. I've never really showed the work. This is the first time I've showed the work, uh, which is 10 pieces of these old masters. Um, so that was really the bridge of Gnawa and Capoeira. Um, so yeah, this is Said. Um, he's another Gnawa master. He's like, so I've been documenting the very young, because normally with Gnawa, you don't just join in. You have to be initiated, or it's normally a a Gnawa family. So when you're born, you're born into the, this, uh, this ritual. Um, so the last, I would say since 98, I've been making the effort every time I'm in Morocco trying to shoot the very young, uh, the middle and the older generation. Because the older generation of Gnawa really suffered because they uh, didn't have the, uh, you know, normally they're very, from a very poor background. And in the olden days, you know, it was literally, you'd have to go out and play for, for food, you know, there's a, there's a, a rhythm of Gnawa, when you do a lira, which is a ceremony night, you pay them some money, but the food has to be one of the main things to feed them, because they normally also they do uh, the slaughter the day before as part of the ceremony. Um, so really that was the attraction, and I took it on myself to uh, document this uh, incredible gem of Morocco. Can you tell us about um, when in 2017 you invited Caporistas to, and there's a beautiful story about the colour. Yes, yeah, so um, it was 2002. Um, this uh, festival in Isawara, Gnawa Festival, just started maybe five years before, and it was becoming popular. It started to get maybe around two, three hundred thousand people coming over five days. And what the festival would do normally, they have maybe 15, 20 masters, and they would invite other musicians to come and join in together. Um, thank you. Um, to share some, you know, some music and, and you know, some to, more than just music. I sort of put a proposal to fuse Capoeira and Gnawa. It was like my dream at that point, um, and they accepted it. So I had, I had something like 11 Capoeiristas that came to Morocco that have never been to Morocco. Uh, they've never, you know, both of them never heard each other's music. They can't they don't speak each other's languages. So it was really tough. I had to come up with an hour and a half show for the opening of the festival in front, live in, on TV in front of a prin princess of Morocco. So it was uh, more pressure than here, I have to say. Um, so um, I sort of somehow pulled off. And the first day that I introduced them, the Gnawa musicians normally play. I don't know if anybody's been to Marrakesh, but there's a big square called Jamaf now, which means um, it's an internal space, basically. When we come and go, and that space is always alive. Um, so I wanted to introduce these you know, guys. They play there for tourists like around six o'clock for a few hours to collect some money. And so I took my Capoeiristas friends to meet them there, so we can go rehearsal and and, and start. Now the the you know, um, that they were wearing red. And red is a color of blood, passion, and go on and on. So all of a sudden, the Capoeiristas started performing without, you know, it's just something happened, started playing. And all of a sudden, one of the Gnome masters pulled out a tunic, because they weren't, as you can see, this is a red tunic, and he pulled out a black one. And he gave it to a female Capoeirista, who's from the Amazon. And the color of black presents the color of the forest. So for me, it was a golden moment. It, you know, it was, couldn't even explain it to anybody. But then I realized there was something going on more between the brotherhood. Thank you. Um, 
So we're going to talk about your relation to color again. And uh, um, it was important to us to show a little bit, to put Hassan's work in context and to show the work of other artists that Hassan greatly admires. So we have an image by Inka Shunibara, um, The Swing, um, after Fragonard. And um, it's a way of introducing the subject of fabrics. Um, Inka is in interested in emphasizing post-colonial, colonial narratives that underline our culture through the use of Dutch wax fabric. And um, you, in your work, Hassan, you use fabric, but in a very different way. It's more to emphasize the diversity of uh, Moroccan culture and also the idi idiosyncratic tastes of um, the people who you work with, who, um, who pose for you. So we chose um, two works, including Kesh Angels. So could you tell us about um, this work, but also about the the fabrics used, because there's a history, isn't there, to all the fabrics that you use in your work? Um, I mean, basically, if this picture, I have to say, this is my inspiration. All the outfits they wear, and they're actually they're theirs. All I've added, there's socks and sunglasses. Um, so most of this, the um, designs I do, you can see where it's coming from. I realise... It, growing up in Morocco and being away from it for a uh, few years, when I went back, I realised how much colour we wear and how much clashing of colour we, 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 you know, we, we, we do. And I'm coming back from London sort of where you know, I'm reading about this colour goes with this and this one doesn't go with that. So I already had this in my mind. And I remember going to a friend's Riyadh, and it, the whole floor was a totally a mess of colours of different tiles. Every time one breaks, he buys the nearest one and puts it in. And that made me realise, don't be scared of colours. Clash, you know, just play around and go with the feeling of, of you know, of how you feel with clashing these colours. Um, so with the textiles, I realised... Um, I'm coming from a background, growing up in London, really... Um, sort of wearing counterfeit products and stuff like that. <laughs> so I was really looking for the cheapest materials in the Medina or, you know, Portobello Road or Chinatown in New York. Wherever I go, I go to the local places where I should, where I imagine that's the places I would have shopped before and I'm still shopping there now. So I really play with this, something that's really cheap and trying to make something out of nothing. Um, and again, trying to make images that could be something from the past, something there, and something hopefully could be still read good in the future. Okay, so um, we're going to, so past, present, future, we're going to stay with the title of, uh, of the symposium. And when, so we asked one of our very um, dear and esteemed friends, um, who's quite established in this field, um, a, to give us uh, her input when we decided to, to do this uh, talk. And um, she asked why an artist of Muslim origin is taught us about Islam, and the same can't be said about every artist who is of Christian origin. Kind of has a point. Um, but we thought um, it'd be interesting to discuss how useful it is to you in your practice to be associated with the notion of contemporary Islamic art. Um, you know, when I got invited to do this. I almost said no. I just found it quite uncomfortable. Um, and that made me realise the reason why. I mean, also, coming here now, I realise I've had, there's been some great speakers, you know, and for me, it's been like a classroom, you know. Um, so I've learned a lot. Some I knew, some I didn't know. Um, but I realised, growing up in London, growing up with friends of mine that were, Jewish, Christian, non-believers, non Muslims, we didn't really discuss religion. We all had the same aim, trying to survive, trying to be creative, um, trying to find our own village with, with the city, because again, as, as I said earlier, on, back in the 80s, we found it very difficult, late 70s, 80s in London, where we didn't have places to go, we didn't have the kind of food we wanted to eat, we, can, we didn't have the style of fashion we wanted to wear, the kind of art we wanted to see, so, so it was really difficult, you know, I'm coming from a background, I wouldn't come to this museum, you know, I'd be too scared to walk into the museum, uh, or commercial galleries, because it was another world. Um, so basically, you know, I'm coming from that background, so as an artist, I do have what so-called Islamic art in my, in my practice, as you could see. 
and I'm aware of this and I play on it. And, but I really try to let the viewer decide from their point of view what they see in it. Um, you know, so my work, I want it to be, um, to really attract somebody like myself and go to a gallery that's not interested in the art to hopefully somebody who's intellectual that could read something deeper than just a pretty picture. So really this is, uh, you know, this is what, um, sort of, I find that word uncomfortable because I'm not coming from a background of, uh, you know, studying. If you said to me Christian art or something like this or Catholic art, I would immediately think of the churches, you know, these great big paintings. I wouldn't think of Damon Hirst as a Christian artist. I, my mind would go to this. So that's what, but that's why it's been great to come here and really to, to listen to the speakers as well. I think one of the strengths of your work is that you're able to speak to people from very different backgrounds. Um, and potentially it's also the fact, one of the reasons being that you have embraced so many different backgrounds and so many different genres of artistic expression in your work. And we're going to talk about this um, um, but first, um, to show a little bit of the work of several other artists. Um, we're going to come back to Hassan Dasi in just a moment. So this is the work of, uh, of an artist called um, um, Katia Kameli, who we wanted to show because her work is also linked to the Damalafna, which is a space that um, Hassan has been very interested in. She's also interested, concerned with um, public life. And this is a work which was um, commissioned by the Marrakesh Biennale. Um, and anybody who wants to learn more about this work, I'm so happy to tell you about it afterwards. But we, to move on, because uh, we're running out of time a tiny bit. Um, this is a work um, that is uh, very dear to Hassan, a very good friend of Hassan, young photographer, amazing photographer um, called uh, Yorias, but goes for the name as Yassine Alaoui Smiley. And um, this is a work from a series um, of a photographic series in which he follows two performers who, over all the odds, are able to join the um, the group of performers in the Gem Lafna. And um, this is a young woman actually called Karima. Um, portrayed here, and this is another photograph by um, by Yorias uh, from um, uh, a series called Casablanca, not the movie that dates to yeah. 2015. Yes, um, I'm a big fan of Yorias because um, he's somebody new who also coming back. He's a, actually a break dancer uh, originally, and he's travelled around the world. And he said to me, you know, when I travel around the world, I realise how can view Morocco from outside? So his first project was to do Cas Casablanca, not a movie, because all we know is the Humphrey Bogart movie that was made in Hollywood. Um, so I connect to his work immediately. He's a street artist. Um, and the other thing that I really liked about him, he didn't go out looking for a gallery or a museum. He's totally started on Instagram and made the, himself popular, big following, and from there he's been winning awards of his images all over the, all, Germany, he just sold 11 pieces to Hermes. So for me, I'm really proud to see somebody who's having a similar journey, and uh, some, you know, he has this big passion what he does, and he's got a specific style when you see his work, with a sense of humor and meaningful. Um, so, and so I'm doing, I actually asked him, I have an old Riyadh in Marrakesh, uh, two years ago, I'd done a, uh, I thought I'd try creating, helping some of my friend photographers in Marrakesh. Uh, I had one two years ago with Nordin Tisrani. That went quite well. So this next year, during 154 Art Fair in Marrakesh, I'm going to do a small solo show in, his, in my house as well. So, yeah, it's, uh, he's a great photographer. It's worth checking him out. So to go back to the work of um, Hassan Dasi, um, Another photographer who's, uh, who's, or artist who's really interested in public space. Um, this is from a series called Portrait de Famille, um, which um, from um, Souk had Oulad Fra in Morocco, but he also staged it in the Netherlands and in France. Um, and um, it's called Portrait de Famille, or Family Portrait, which leads us, and we're very lucky today, to see we have this image here. It's a first. This is Hassan's family portrait. Can anybody recognize Hassan? Actually, it's a Mexican family. <laughs> um, 
this um, this is, I say, my third picture in my life uh, when I was before going to England. Uh, the first picture I was on the plastic horse with a cowboy outfit. outfit. The second one I was in the pla in the metal car with a racing, you know, like a racing car. And this is was the local photographer, the studio photographer that was in the middle of La Rache, the downtown where I was grew up. Um, now, you have to understand, this picture was taken because my dad was living in England from the 60s, and he wanted a picture of us. Um, all the clothes we were wearing, that was my dad's, you know, buying us the clothes when he comes over, he gives us all these clothes. And my mum actually put cologne on me to go and have this picture taken. And I remember, like, pointing, you know, pointing the side pass in and pointing cologne. Um, this image really stuck with me in the sense of, you know, as, as I kind of analysed my work, because I've had to learn as I went along, and I was asked, you know, being asked about the studio of photography and Malik Sadibi and you know all this kind of journey of uh, of, of these kind of photographers, um, and I realised this was the first impact. I remember the day I went there. I remember the light. It was hot. You know, the shadow. The you know the the sea. Um, the, the, you know, go in there, then having the portrait, then you have to wait like maybe three or five days to go and pick up the print. So this stayed with me, and in my practice with, uh, you know, with the studio photography, this definitely was one of the big influences for me. So, um, fashion and music has played a very important, plays a very important role in your work. Could you tell us more about how your work in fashion and music led you to photography and art? Um, I mean, uh, for this I have to go back. Um, Earlier on, I said I was unemployed for about six, seven years in London. Um, after this, somehow I've got a small boot. I saw these friends of mine, and like I said, around the 80s, were trying to fit in with London and the UK, and I had all these friends coming out of college doing design from London, and they were setting up selling in Camden Market, and you know, just sort of. Uh, um, I found a small boutique, didn't know what I was doing, but I said I'll open up a fashion shop. You know, I suppose you know, it's called street fashion. Um, so it started with a few friends from London, and then I started coming to New York, started getting some other labels from New York. And so this was the first impacts of fashion. You know, I had to create different designers to make a look. Um, so I was the one who was doing the fashion. I had a friend of mine who was just starting his career as, an assist, as a stylist. Uh, he asked me to assist in, uh, be an assistant for him for a couple of catwalk shows and some magazines. I had another friend of mine, great, uh, the great Zach Ovey as well, who was just doing music videos. I worked behind the scene with him. So this was really my schooling, and that really came out in the influence of my work. So Zach Ovey, um, who I think you bought your camera off him. Yes. Yeah? Um, so Zach is the, um, is the son of a pioneering... Um, black cinema <laughs> mm -hmm. um, director called Orasovi and so with films like uh, Reggae in 1971 and Pressure in 1976 so I don't want to politicise your work but I do want to impress on the audience that um, when you were growing up you were very aware of a growing self-determination and politicisation among Afro-Caribbean um, Asian Arab communities in London at the time and this is at also at a time when the black British artists were um, so this is a, a still from pressure by um, um, this is a work by um, Keith Piper um, and it's entitled uh, black assassin um, saints from 1982 an artist who was associated with the black art movement Artists who were really interested in emphasizing the racism and xenophobism that they found present in English institutions at the time. So you were aware of all this. And you've often said that when you started creating, it was first and foremost for your friends. Now, Hassan is very humble, and he won't readily admit <laughs> to having been a very important part of a a fascinating subculture in London has had a huge influence on UK society. So I don't have to be humble for you, so I'm going to name drop. Um, so this is Ian Wright, who's a very important footballer. If you know anything about football, he this played for yeah. Yeah. Crystal Palace, and he's wearing Hassan's work, Rap. Yeah, exactly. yeah that, that was named the store Rap in, from 1984. <laughs> And uh, when Soul to Soul hit yeah. um, the charts in England with Moving in 1989, Karen Wheeler was also 
wearing your work. Um, Hassan was also DJing. You supported um, a young Carl Cox, um, London Posse, pirate, yeah. pirate DJs. So Hassan was really at the center of this uh, really vibrant scene in, um, in London. And it's part of your work that hasn't really been discussed much, apart from Echo, who's talked about it. Um, and it's really central to understanding your work, and especially um, the work um, which Linda um, showed earlier about um, my rock stars, which is the next part of the next slide. Could you tell us more about my rock stars and the way that you work with other creatives? Um, again, growing up in London, having uh, me and all these amazing people that, um, as I say, influenced me and inspired me from all different parts of the world, we didn't have a stage. So for me, when I do a studio shoot, it's a stage. I'm setting up a stage. That's why I call it My, my Rock Stars. Um, and also, there, all of us were striving. We're like the underdogs. We felt like we, we had always had to fight. Um, my Rock Stars is really, I would say, uh, you know, the Kesh Angels and the, the Gnome music, that's my Moroccan side trying to show something from Morocco to my friends and hopefully the public outside. And my rock stars is growing up in London and what was around me. Um, when I started doing this series, I knew there was going to be maybe a flack of people going, oh, you know, Malik Sadibi and, you know, go on and on, which I'm a big fan of. And I had to analyse this, kind of, uh, this kind of work that I was going to put out. And I realised people like Malik Sadibi and the photographer that I was, you know, I was, I was a sitter for, they were the local photographers that were, you know, taking pictures of their, their own town or, or city. So they were documenting that time. Uh, and I don't, it probably wasn't looking at art that time. It was just, you know, people having portraits because there weren't cameras around as much as now. Uh, and then I realized all my friends have had a similar journey. They're coming from different parts of the world. This one's a singer, this one's a dancer, this one's a designer. We're all kind of trying to make it, trying to survive. And I'd sort of, this is the reason why I called my rock stars. And also it was about documenting these movements that, that was happening. Uh, you know, the, the, from, uh, uh, for me also, when I take this picture, she lives in Nigeria now, Helen. But I know I was there in London when I took this. So it's really documenting as well, more than just having these pretty pictures. And, and also trying to show uh, there's great artists all over the world that don't get a look in and most of them survive. And for me, these are the real artists as well. So you, you often mention Melik Sidibe and Sedou Keta as, um, as influences, and their work is very, um, is often discussed in terms of the performance or the performative aspect. How important is um, the, the moment when you, when you are there with the model and you're taking the photograph, how much do they bring to, to the shoot? Um, I'm, I've, been, I've been really lucky because most of the people I've been sh shooting, they're some kind of performers. Uh, they already understand their body language. Uh, you know, if you're talking about musicians, they're already performing and, and you know, playing. Um, I, most, all my images are taken out in the street. So it's quite interesting when you set up in the streets and you start to take pictures and there's people walking around. That really shows also the strength of the sitter. Um, so lots of the time, I always have a plan with the sitter and, and you know what I'm thinking, but I always sort of let loose and see what comes out on on, on the moment. When we started discussing fr uh, frames, I also it's only then that I really came to realise how um, there's a second moment in which you continue to play with your work with your photographs in the relationship between the frames and the final image which you choose. So could you tell us a little bit more about the relationship between um, frames and the image? Um, my early body of work was um, all about Arabic product. You know, I didn't even see it as artistically then. Uh, it was basically, you know, took, collected all these products, took pictures and printed them on canvas and said, I don't share them with my friends, graffiti artists, graf uh, graphic designers, blah, blah, blah. Um, when I decided to put the first prints of my photography, 
I, I'm a big fan of hand prints, beautiful frame, black and white. You know, this is, I'm coming from that kind of way, thinking about photography. But I felt at that point I was still young enough to play around. So I wanted to bridge something from the old work that was actually, you know, just a print into 3D. And also, I knew the power of the brands that could attract the eye, and also working on these kind of repeated patterns that we have in that as mosaic. Um, and as, you know, it was learning as I went along, and then I realized sometimes, like, Cobra Man says from Brazil, and, you know, the Pimienti, you know, it's the chili from, from South, South America. So sometimes I try to play around with the product and the sitter. I think for some people who discover that your work is not automatically, we don't necessarily understand just how much work goes into, um, how much preparations goes into this work. And you collect sometimes a piece of fabric or a can, which will be in that tiny little studio space, that dungeon, and it will stay there for years until, right, until you suddenly take it out. Can you? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, every studio, you know, somebody's working in film will have their film equipment, a painter will have their painting, you know, for me, my studio looks like a shop, like a corner shop. Um, and normally, I'm always looking, and also with textile, as you can see, he's wearing a suit that I've designed, and it's actually, a, you know, the flower bags that used to be made in cotton. Um, I normally collect, design, have lots of stuff sitting around. So when I have the sitter or I'm going to shoot, then I try to work out exactly what he or she going to wear or they. And so I start back, back to front. Um, then once the image is shot and printed, then I have to find, make sure I have enough cans to go around the frame um, and work out which can go with the, with the image. So there's a long process. So you know, when I look at this image, for me, there's a process of finding the fabric and very background, dirty Marrakesh market. Uh, Cobra Mansa was only in London for two days doing a workshop. The shoes, God bless my friend Miro, who was the, a great shoemaker in Morocco. He made the shoe for me. The beer and bell, somebody sent that from Brazil. And the hat is wearing Aswad. There was a big reggae band from the 70s, gave me the hat as a present. And then the cans are picked from London, and the backdrop is from Senegal. So it's a long process uh, to do that, to, to get an image uh, thing. But sometimes people think it's just print, and, and it's done. In terms of time, um, another thing that's very interesting about your work is how loyal you are to, to the people who surround you and to the sitters. who uh, um, Or the people who you base your work on. And um, the film that you that you produced about Karima the Henna Girl, which was premiered at, at uh, LACMA, um, is a really good image of this. Uh, well, I have to thank Linda for believing in my film um, uh, to show it at LACMA. Um, the, you know, I, I look at myself as uh, I'm using photography as a medium. Um, the strength of my work is the people. You know, it's not just about me. It's actually the sitter because they're the ones that grab people's attention. Um, so Karima, as a film, I thought what I wanted to do is step aside and trying to make this person come alive. You know, why I'm attracted to this person and her energy. Um, so Karima was one of the. I just want, I want to do. If you want to do a documentary on Cobra Mansa, for example. So the idea was, I'll step aside. And I wanted to make a documentary, spend a day with Karima from the morning to the evening to show. Because Karima is a third generation in Jamafna Square. I've known her since she was about 15. Uh, she's married, got two kids. She, she does henna. So for me, she's an artist in the square. She's street smart, speaks about four or five languages. Um, and somebody that, you know, uh, she's amazing. Um, so I wanted to capture this on film because I thought it was unfair to just have the still. Karim is the one on the right hand side that leaning, so you could, you could see her character immediately. Um, so this is, was the first part of uh, trying to pull out some of the characters of my work and make something, a documentary on them, say it's about them and not about me all the time. And on top of you said about you know, being generous with the artist because really at the end of the day, you know, if I'm having a show with the, my, my friends with these amazing people, 
they're the ones that are giving me, you know, making me being, being here in the sense. It's their part of their journey. And I'm always very proud when I see this because I feel, when I see my friends hanging in, uh, in the museums and galleries, I feel proud and, I, you know, they're traveling with me. Um, on a funny note, we could say this, I, uh, the V&A bought two pieces of my work uh, via Rose Issa. And uh, I didn't realize when they had the show and they had the opening, they had the two images hanging side to side. One was of Karima and one was of Saida, another girl. And as soon as I walked in, I realized Karima actually taught Saida henna and had to sell on the street. So for me, that was like an incredible moment to, you know, there's all these images and they that chose those two and they were hanging out in the V&A. So that for me, that was a, a big moment. Um, we're going to show um, a trailer of Karima, um, but um, we're going to leave you with that. And I'm going to. Uh, Hassan has given me the honour of uh, um, saying the closing closing remarks. Um, so thank you, Hassan, first of all for all these beautiful thank moments, you. because I think that's what brings us all to want to see your work time and again for these beautiful moments that you talk about. Um, In terms of, um, um, so this conference kind of asks us to consider contemporary Islamic art and a very wide definition. And I think it's, it was interesting to me to think of Hassan's work um, like um, this, um, in this installation, this exhibition I called uh, La Salle de Gym des Femmes Arabes, um, which uh, dates to 2016. Did you want to? No? Okay. Um, to me, Hassan's work offers us a way out of um, Islamo pessimism, and I take the, this kind of idea from um, uh, Okwi and Vizel's idea of um, Afro pessimism from 2006, and it's so it, in, it's so exciting to see the the interest that um, Hassan's work. Um, has or creates um, among a young population of creatives um, all around um, the Islamic world. And um, the relaunch of rap was embraced by um, such a, an effervescence of young creatives who've come forward and who want to know more and who want to, to, dem to show you their work. And that's so exciting. Uh, I've been very lucky because uh, at the age of the internet and uh, I didn't realize there were so many young people following the work. Uh, this is actually my son. Um, rap, <laughs> yeah. um, rap was a label, as I said, I had a store in 1984 and uh, around 86, 87 I started buying fabrics and making uh, you know, sort of designs that I thought would sell with the name of rap and then it became an underground label, never made any money, but a lot of my good friends wore the stuff and, and you know, uh, supported me. Um, and then Echo, Oshim, when he wrote the piece about rap, he really painted the backdrop of London. I mean, if you can read that, you can really understand London, not just about me, but how London was. And he almost brought tears in my eyes because then I realized I was just another seed of this thing that was going on, this kind of thing that was becoming the melting pot and, and, and this. Um, and then this was, I think I showed this collection in Dubai two years ago. Um, this is my friend's son, Moses. <laughs> hey, Great. That was my creative. Uh... I like that. Um, yeah, so this was really, I, I got asked in Dubai to do a small collection backed up by, I can't remember who, um, sponsored by Cadillac, funny enough. Um, so it was just really kind of making a few pieces. Um, it was part of a two-day festival with music and fashion and art. Um, and I really didn't take it serious, I thought, because it was the first time in 20 years that I was asked to, to do this. And all I had about rap was the memory of me growing up because it was part of my lifestyle. I mean, I couldn't design for myself with it. I had to re That's why I took my son and Moses out to think, well, if I was this young, at that age, for rap, these are the kind of kids who wear the stuff. 
So done the you know so that was came out of that, and then I was amazed how much people kind of uh, took note, especially the younger generation. I was quite impressed. Shall we? Yes. Yeah, so we're going to show the trailer. Yeah. Uh, so before you show this, one of the reasons I've done this uh, documentary. Sorry, I'm going on, but we're going we're going to finish with this. Um, over the years of my images with the veil, I always get asked you know, from my culture, but especially from the West, you know, you have these intelligent writers and they either come out with the first question about the veil or give you a great sort of interview and the last thing was about the veil. And a lot of the times I didn't want to answer, uh, you know, give a straight answer because my mum wore a veil, my grandma wore a veil, my auntie wore a veil, it was something that was, you know, traditional, I didn't even look at it as an Islamic, you know, I don't even think it's in the Quran. Um, so when I made the film, because Karima wears a veil, I really wanted the kind of documentary to answer these questions to, to the journalists. So that's the result of this. It needs some music, actually. Can you stop? Uh, Thank you. 